You're listening to the Turn Autism Around podcast, episode number 220. Today, we have a very special guest, Dr. Barbara Esch, who is both a speech pathologist and a board certified behavior analyst at the doctoral level. Barb is the author of the ESA, which is the ECHOIC assessment, which is part of the VBMAP assessment. We heard from Dr. Mark Sundberg last week's uh, episode. And so Dr. Esch has worked with Mark Sundberg and others in the verbal behavior field. Um, She's been in the field for over 30 years. And her new book, her new manual is the Early Echoic Skills Assessment and Manual for Speech Acquisition. That's going to be coming out soon. Today's episode, we focus on things I learned from Dr. Barbara Esch over the years. And we talk about echoics. We talk about how language develops, um, how it's never too late. And we give some examples with older kids how, you know, we can get uh, just that language progressing as naturally as possible, and then we can get better language over time. It's a great episode. Hope you love it as much as I do. Let's get to this episode with Dr. Barb Esch. Okay, I have Barb Esch here, who is just one of my heroes, one of the real proponents in the field. So thank you for joining us today, Barb. Yeah, it's great to be here. Yeah, we haven't gotten together in person for a very long time. So we're going to have to uh, figure that out soon. But let's just jump right in. Um, If you've listened to my podcast, you'll know that I start out with the same question. Describe your fall into the autism world. Oh, my fall. (laughs) Oh, what an opportunity. Yeah. Um, You know, at the time that I was um, acquiring my skills and my education and behavior analysis, which came after I was already working as a speech pathologist, um, I think um, the whole autism world sort of began exploding. You know, I think that there was funding for it. There was attention to it in the public schools. Um, parents were interested in, in home programming and so on. And so it, there was kind of this matchup that, that happened in time um, that was sort of serendipitous. And it just worked out that there was this wonderful population of people <laughs> that um, wanted to work with me and that I could work with to um, begin to see how we could apply the principles of behavior analysis and the techniques and so on to um, jumpstart speech and strengthen language. So I don't know if that exactly answers the question, but I think, you know, this was kind of happening in my life back in the 80s and 90s. So you were already a speech pathologist Mm -hmm. in the 80s and 90s, and then you became a a BCBA and then a BCBAD Mm -hmm. um, pretty early on, as soon as it was like a credential. Like yes. Yes. I worked as a speech pathologist in public schools and in hospitals, um, rehab centers, nursing homes. I worked with some geriatric folks as well, um, but primarily in preschool and elementary. Um, I did a lot of work with head injured people and people with acquired brain injury um, and um, and part of the population that I was working with in addition to um, deaf, uh, hearing impaired and physically impaired was this um, population of children that were diagnosed with autism. And so um, at that point, I decided to start taking classes uh, toward uh, a BCBA. And, um, And then after a while, I decided, you know, I really need to just take a leave from um, my jobs and I need to go back to school. So I did, I I moved to Kalamazoo, Michigan and my husband was uh, a behavior analyst. He he stayed in Florida and we kind of did the travel back and forth 
you know, visiting each other, but I was in grad school at Western Michigan University um, with the likes of Kyle Miguel and Anna Petters Dotier and Sarah Lachago and some of those folks um, studying with Jack Michael and Jim Carr. So it was a wonderful, wonderful education. And it really, it's kind of like drinking the Kool-Aid. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, I think you were one of the last or the last PhD students of Dr. Jack Michael. Yeah. Sarah Lechuga, uh, we did a podcast interview with her. We can link that in your show notes. Um, so you do have a very unique combination. You're an SLP, BCBA, D. Uh, the D on the end means doctorate. Um, and uh, so with that combination... Um, and with all your research and being really in the thick of, you know, at Western Michigan, where met much of the research is done, and just over the years as being the combination of both, um, we've had many SLP BCBAs on the show. Uh, recently, we had Sarah I. Risen, um, and we can link her in the show notes, but she told me there was under 500 still the combination of SLP BCBAs. We will also have... Rose Griffin from ABA Speech and Tammy Casper, who I know is a good friend of yours. She's an SLP BCBA. Um, her episode was all about apraxia and autism. So we can link those in the show notes. There's others that have been on too, but tell me about that combination of SLP BCBA and like what you see in terms of, you know, SLPs in general, like their education about autism and about ABA and same with BCBAs, their education about speech and things like that. Yeah, well, there's opportunities on both sides, certainly. Um, uh, speech pathologists have um, lots and lots of background and information in listening um, to what comes out of your mouth and what that sounds like and how to analyze it and so on. A lot of information about physiological processes that are going on in the mouth and the throat and, and you know, all of the um, mechanism for voicing and, and vocalizing. Um, but I think where it becomes really um, sort of the gold standard is when you add in knowledge of how people learn things, um, how what happens when children start to speak, um, look at the millions and millions typical development where we all learn to talk, most of us, with no formal education at all. It, it, we're already talking up a storm by the time we're three or four, and certainly we haven't been to school yet. So blending the expertise that speech pathologists bring um, with the expertise of behavior analysis, how people learn, um, is, I think, a perfect combination for addressing the needs of children with a diagnosis of autism. I think, um, you know, if there was one um, uh, sort of statement I could make to parents and teachers and of, of folks that have children under their care with a diagnosis of autism, it's um, that um, relax with this as much as you possibly can. Um, there are people that can help and it's, I don't think ever too late to get started um, trying to get vocalizing from someone that hasn't been vocalizing, but you have to do it in a really smart way with good uh, teaching techniques so that you can strengthen what's coming out and so that you don't um, ask the learner to do things that are sort of out of sequence um, taking steps before they can crawl, for example. And so I enjoy having sort of those two hats. Um, one of the things that, that I did in 2005 was um, 
I was still in grad school and I remember asking Dr. Jim Carr, my advisor at the time, how is it that you can start a new SIG at uh, a new special interest group at the Association for Behavior uh, or for, um, yeah, the, for ABAI Association for Behavior Analysis International. And he said, well, I think you just can apply for it. So, um, so I did, and it was a very simple process. And that SIG is called SPABA, S-P-A-B-A. And there is a website, I think it's still um, behavioralspeech.com. Okay. And Nikki Dower is the chairperson of the, that SIG now. But um, that's a great resource also to possibly link. Um, yeah, we can definitely link that in the yeah. show notes. And they also have the speech pathology and ABA is a, a very active Facebook group. Um, yes. Nikia yeah. Dow um, describes these SLP BCBAs as unicorns or somebody in that group because, uh, you know, that seems to be the term. But yeah, when I need um, guests for the podcast on a specific speech related topic, I always like to go first in there and see if I can find uh, an SLP BCBA who has experience with that topic, because I think I said this last time I interviewed an SLP BCBA is I don't think I've met one that I don't like. (laughs) Um, We tend to have very similar uh, philosophies and very similar ways of trying to help uh, kids, whether they're our own children or um, whether they're our clients. So um, way back, I I think it was 2015 because I think I had started my online course and we're just coming, we're just past or coming up to um, the eight year anniversary of my very first online course. Um, it, it was initially titled Autism ABA Help Online Training for Professionals and Gung Ho Parents. And since then, I've also added the intermediate course, changed those two courses to a verbal behavior bundle and added my toddler course. But I was already, I already worked for the verbal behavior project. I wrote my first book, the verbal behavior approach, like I was in it, you know, and I had started an online course. And then I signed up to come to your ABI, ABAI workshop. It was a three hour workshop. You actually repeated something very similar at Penn State at the National Autism Conference, which we can actually link that in the show notes because I have linked it for my online members. It's a very excellent talk, uh, three-hour talk. And like I said, I, I felt like, you know, writing the verbal behavior approach book, not, not that I had it all figured out, but I learned so much in that three-hour workshop that you gave, Barb, that... I do want to kind of point out some of the things I learned um, that some of my listeners may not know. And it it was the thing that caused me to create some blogs, create some processes within my courses, because I think a lot of people, a lot of us get it wrong when it comes to uh, getting speech when a child has none or has very little. So some of the things was that... Um, you know, if a child, no matter what their chronological age is, if they just started talking, just started saying word approximations, you can't expect great articulation or great, uh, you know, clarity right away. I mean, some kids do start talking and they're pretty clear, but, you know, if a child's six and their articulation is butt up or pretzel, you know, if they just started talking, that's okay. We're not, we shouldn't dive in too quickly to articulation. We have to consider the age of babbling word approximations and your first words. Do you have anything to say about that point? Yeah, I sure do. And I'm so glad that you brought that up. Um, it, you know, I think about it, it kind of as an analogy to learning to walk. None of us would even consider taking a, 
a person that was just learning to walk and pushing them to, to run if they were still kind of at the crawling, barely able to stand up stage. We just wouldn't do it. We recognize that, that things happen in a sequence. And speaking is um, a mechanical skill. It becomes um, a, a much more sophisticated automatic skill of moving all of your articulators, your tongue, your vocal cords, your lips, your jaw, all of that has to move in concert along with breathing and all of that sort of thing. But it happens in particular sequences. So if you look at a newborn infant um, up to about the age of three, three, let's say three to five months, um, most of what comes out of their mouth are vowel sounds. And they're still learning to move their tongue in various positions. They're learning to breathe and vocalize on exhalated air, not inhalated air, because infants do phonate uh, or vocalize on inhalation. So that has to all kind of get in place. And then um, they begin to make some consonant sounds sort of randomly. And at that same time, parents and other caregivers are reinforcing the ones of those sounds that occur in whatever the language is of that family, that caregiving unit. And so those sounds, those syllables get selected um, and, and so they're sort of automatically reinforcing and those are the building blocks. So for example, sometimes I've heard people say, uh, or ask, well, if, if they can say um, mama, um, isn't it the same it, um, difficulty to say mommy? And, um, and it isn't. And the reason it isn't, uh, even though you have um, the same consonant in both of those, the M consonant, you have two syllables in both of those, mama and mommy, that you, you don't have the same vowels. In the first one, mama, you have the same vowel repeated twice. Just repeated. It's called reduplicated. And that's what babies do. Ba, 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 ma, 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 ma. We hear that all the time. Um, and then they begin to sort of expand and vary some of those other vowels and consonant sounds. So when we code, and this is what speech pathologists know how to do, we code what children say, or what learners say, we can, we can assign a code how many different consonants were in that, how many different vowels were in that, and that's what we call syllable complexity. And in my new manual that's coming out, I think we'll talk about that in a bit, um, there's a whole chapter on syllable complexity. So that's what you learned at that at that workshop was kind of my attempt to have people be comfortable with misarticulated uh, fledgling syllable strings that beginning learners are, are coming out with. And it doesn't matter whether they're two or 12 or 22, yeah. It's important to think about kind of to do a baseline of what are what are the skills that they have right now? What kind of how, how complex are the syllables that they can say? And how, what's the next higher complexity level? Let's take them to that next higher level. And if you approach it like that, if you approach speech training like that, um, it, it's, it will never be easy, but it's much less difficult because you actually can kind of take it step by step. And you can go from, for example, um, tata to taka to taco. And now you've got a usable word, um, but you couldn't get there 
in a leap. You have to kind of go in steps. Yeah. So this coding that you do that you're talking about, I kind of think of it like as a little shorthand. And I, I was always impressed by speech pathologists who would be in the room with me and they'd be scripting out like I couldn't even hear it because I'm not trained in that. But I, I remember a couple other things from the three hour workshop. Again, we're going to be able to link that in the show notes. That's going to be marybarbera.com forward slash 220. That's going to be Barb's episode. But you you did mention it, but vowels are the first uh, babbles usually. So ah, uh, you know, ah, uh, ba ba ba, and the b or the m, they'll usually come a little bit later. But you also talked in that workshop about vowel neighbors, I think you called it, and that and ah uh, versus a versus, I and there's like five different a's. Um, or whatever, like there were just so many, is it the, ah, uh, is it, ah, uh, like Apple, is it, ah, uh, like at a dentist going, ah, uh, is it a, you know, um, just so complex. So if you have a non-vocal child or, or clients, it really is important that you have a speech pathologist on the team, if they're becoming, you know, vocal to, to help you figure out what is the baseline, um, if if that's possible? But um, sometimes speech pathologists um, who don't who aren't familiar with ABA can focus on the wrong things, not, not because they don't know how to code, or maybe they don't. They maybe they know about you know talkers and and vowel vowel neighbors and stuff but then they tend to want to jump to uh, carrier phrases which can increase the syllable length and one of the big takeaways like literally I came home from that three-hour workshop which was before ABAI and I changed a lot for my independent clients for my course you know because one of the big things you said which was a huge takeaway for me is, um, you know, the syllable length. So you have refrigerator, which is one word, five syllables, and the cat drank the milk is five words, one syllable each, for, so five syllables. And when you add, you know, I want or please and thank you at the end of things, you automatically raise those syllable lengths. So if even if you have decent articulation or not good articulation, you're just going to, you know, mess things up. So I give the example, like if a child is saying pretzel, pretzel, you know, and it's two syllables and now you add, I want in front of it. And then you say, well, we have to go to an AAC because he's not understandable. Do you have anything to say about that? <laughs> yes, I do. Um, yeah, I've worked with a lot of AACs, and I know that um, there are a lot of speech pathologists that that support that. And I think that you know there is a place for that and a time for that. I tend to not worry about that so much, and I've been very lucky in my professional career to be able to focus on. Um, something else, which is getting um, vocalizing jump started. And for exactly the reason that you say, um, I would want to um, rule out every possible uh, uh, approach that we that can be tried to uh, to get speech in place before I want to consider not using speech and you know um there are reasons for that you know uh speech has what i call have a section in chapter one of of my new isa manual um the big five you know speech is fast easy cheap it's always with you and 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 um people can respond to it. Um, and so you want to get as many of those five as you possibly can. Um, I think that by 
counting syllables instead of words, it frees people of that confusion or that awful feeling that, gosh, I've been trying so hard and my, my learner is just not progressing. I would want to sort of step back and say, well, what did that progression look like? Was it, um, was it sequential? Were you counting syllables instead of words? In it's kind of the advantage of also of phonetic transcription instead of alphabet letters, you know, and um, that that you want to you want to know how many syllables can this person handle? How many different? Not how many consonants, but how many different consonants? Not how many vowels, but how many different vowels within any kind of a syllable string, whether it's two or three or four or more syllables. What children do automatically, typically developing children or, or any other person that's learning to talk, is when the, the, the load becomes too weighty, too, too much. Um, they'll drop something out and, you know, think about, for example, saying a tongue twister. What do we do to get it right? We slow down. Mm -hmm. And if we don't slow down, we drop out syllables. So it's not unusual, for example, for a, a small child that's learning to talk to say pooter instead of computer or buffi for butterfly. And the child's verbal community or caregiving community, um, also, I guess you could call them the language teaching community, we accept that. We accept it for years. We accept articulation errors. Um, many, many children go to kindergarten um, not being able to say all of their sounds correctly. And that's not a concern generally. Um, and the reason for that, not being able to do that is practice time. We need more, that learner needs more practice time with changing from whatever number of syllables they can say to the next higher number whatever number of different consonants, if they can handle saying two syllables with two different consonants, now we need to put a third consonant in those two syllables or a second vowel in there so that we need to very carefully change the, the difficulty level, just like we would graduate steps. We wouldn't expect uh, a, a young person that's learning to walk to step up really high uh, if the step is too great. It, it, we just wouldn't expect that. And yet when it comes to language, I think lots of times people don't think about it as a mechanical skill as well as a behavioral skill. Um, they just think about it as a behavioral skill. So. Yeah. I would encourage parents and teachers and anybody that's trying to teach somebody how to speak to think about what are the mechanics involved in what I'm asking them to say from cookie to I uh, want cookie to I want cookie, please. That's a huge, huge step um, of many more syllables, many more cons different consonants, many more different vowels. And the reason it's difficult is for the reason that you brought up um, the vowel neighborhoods. It, the vowel neighborhoods is just a chart um, that that I um, wrote or drew, and um, what it shows really is a the position in the mouth that the tongue has to be for all the, these different vowels. So. Um, so for example, to say E, um, the tongue has to be up really high in the front. And to say ooh, it has to be really low and in the back and kind of bunched up. 
uh, in the back. Well, if you throw in a consonant like T, for example, and you, and you want the child to say uh, toe or two, um, the tongue has to move in a very different way than if you want them to say T. And so that's, that knowledge, I think, is what speech pathologists can bring to the picture. And then um, with a background in behavior analysis or working with a behavior analytic consultant, you can avoid sort of a, another trap that I don't know if you were going to ask about this, but um, that is to put the, the, the word or the utterance in some kind of context that matters to the child. So, um, you know, we all spend time with children saying, say mama, say daddy, um, say this or say that. And the reason we do that is not because we just want them to repeat us, but because we want them to learn to say those same things in other contexts, like when they want something or when they see something. And so there are a lot of natural environment kinds of training contexts where we can use the echoic as a prompt to strengthen asking for things or naming things or commenting on things and so on. Yeah, we definitely are gonna move into the echoics in, in a minute. But before we do that, I just want to mention a couple things as you were talking. I was like, yes, this is totally, um, you know, things I learned at that workshop. And I mean, over the years, too, um, one of the things I came back and I, I uh, assessed all my clients in terms of syllable length. And the one little boy was at a two, uh, two syllable length in general. So he could say circle and he could also say, you know, one word like nose and and those sorts of things. So one of the interventions was when we were within manding, when we were, you know, on the magnitudal making a circle, instead of just saying circle, like we had been doing, we would say draw circle. Mm -hmm. And so like, just to get them up to the next level, I did a video blogs on what's wrong with the goal of Timmy to speak in four word utterances. Uh, we can link in the show notes as well as a carrier phrase blog, why I don't use carrier phrases, because it not only can crash articulation and is a huge jump up from two syllables to four syllables, those words don't tend to really matter to the child. And they can also affect spontaneous manding if every time the child spontaneously mans for one or two syllables, and then you, even if they can clearly say it, say it in a big, like a big boy, say it in a sentence. And it tends to really mess up language. And finally, before we move on to echoics and your your new book and your uh, ESA, is um, I also heard a lecture also at the National Autism Conference with um, Dr. Vincent Carbone speaking, and he uh, was talking all about how we should let language progress to two word utterances before we go messing with it too much because it can it can really, um, you know, adding carrier phrases or, or adding things that aren't, you know, teaching colors, for instance, and, and making them say yellow chair or whatever can mess with the just the natural language that's going to develop if we rush it. And um, I tried to get him on the show, uh, but couldn't. So I ended up doing a, a, a solo show on his, his lecture. And that's a really good one that we don't talk about much, but I think the listeners listening to you talk, Barb, and, uh, you know, would be interested. That's uh, episode number 94, and we can link that in the show notes. Oh, and one more thing. In, I have another podcast with Joanne Garinser, and I'm sure you're familiar with her and her work. No, she's an SLP BCBA. And she was doing a lecture in my county early, early on. Like Lucas was like four years old, my son Lucas. And um, she 
I was having problems because his articulation, like instead of saying water, he'd say warrior. So we started emphasizing like water and he could say it water. And then, but we started also emphasizing everything like cup and, and cat. And what he did was he added, which I didn't know what it was. That's why I, I asked Joanne Guerin, sir, over email, but he added a schwa ending when you're overemphasizing, like say cup, and then the child hears cuppa and he starts talking like a little Italian. So I have that in my first, in my first book, The Verbal Behavior Approach, how we stopped overemphasizing ending consonants to get rid of that little problem. But the other thing she said, which I don't remember you talking about it in the three hour workshop, but I've done a lot more work over it and um, over the years is the correlation, Joanne Garrenser, when she was saw Lucas for um, for a few moments, she said, "Get rid of that sippy cup because he had a spill proof sippy cup with a valve." And and we've had Melanie Potok, who is uh, an expert SLP on you know oral motor feeding issues, and and I say it in chapter ten of my Turn Autism Around book is. I really haven't met a child who's not speaking, who doesn't also, that has autism that, or signs of autism that also um, ha, doesn't have feeding issues, like sucking and you, you're you talking about the tongue and, and the movement of the tongue. And a lot of times that, I don't know which comes first, but the the tongue's not moving the right way because they're still sucking on bottles, pacifiers, spill-proof sippy cups. So we can, you know, link that stuff in the show notes too. And I don't know if you have any additional things to say before we move to echoics, you know, because this is all like trying to get babbling, trying to get word approximations, and then, then coming to where we want to improve clarity and improve echoics. But do you have anything to add there in terms of feeding and sucking and tongue movements and talking? Um, well, I won't get into that too much, although I've done some swallowing work and some of that. Um, there, there are, there's divided opinion about whether or not oral motor um, work will improve speech or whether it will just improve um, oral motor movement and swallowing and chewing and things like that. So, um, you know, I, it would be if those were the concerns that you know you'd want to speak with someone specifically about your particular learner your child but um, you know in a more general statement I could say that um, because speech is a mechanical skill um, it, it requires a lot of practice and if you have a plug that's sort of in your mouth, uh, a plug of any kind, uh, a finger, a thumb, a, a pacifier, a rag, um, you know, I've seen them all, a uh, shirt, <laughs> um, then, um, then those um, parts of your body don't have the same opportunity for the same amount of practice. Mm -hmm. And, um, you know, I will say this about practice, it's uh, unfortunately, often the case that in school programs, children receive like a 15 or 30 minute intensive um, speech therapy session, and they might do that if they're lucky every day or three times a week or whatever. But if you think about um, it, uh, how often um, your average speaker that's three years old or five years old or eight years old um, vocalizes and says something. It's not um, a big intensive um, time from eight o'clock to 8.30 in the morning and again from two to 2.30 in the afternoon. It's all day long. It's sprinkled in kind of like salt and pepper on mashed potatoes. <laughs> you know, it's just always there. And so um, that's something that I think, um, you know, parents often say, well, what can we do? Um, you don't have to be an expert, but you can um, make sure that this mechanism, um, these muscles are beginning to get enough practice to move in concert. So any kind of um, activity that gets 
vocalizing happening with tongue movement, lip movement, jaw movement, I think is all to the good. Um, uh, because that's the one piece, I think when people think about a child learning to talk, they, they might sort of focus on the behavioral aspects, the learning aspects, like they're learning to do this or that, but um, which is true, they're learning to say particular things, but some of that learning is mechanical, just like typing, or walking or doing anything to a level of expertise and automaticity. So you and I, as we're speaking right now, um, probably neither one of us is paying a whole lot of attention to what our jaw is doing or our tongue movement or whatever. Um, I am a little bit because I, had to have speech therapy for a lisp when I was younger, when I was actually um, uh, in college as an undergrad. Um, so I do kind of monitor that um, so it doesn't pop out too much. Yeah. But in general, I would encourage people to, um, to do what they can to provide a lot of just uh, sound making practice to um, help that mechanical system become more sophisticated. Yeah. And if a child does have some clear words, I, I actually created this procedure somewhere along the way, but I say number one words is words that anybody would say, yeah, that, that is cup, that is cat, that is pizza. Um, to record those words as number one words uh, clearly articulated words. And then uh, a list of number two words might be baba for bottle or, or, mm -hmm. you know, um, kind of deleting the end or begin. it's, it's kind of like non-speech therapy way of figuring things out. And then the number two word lists also get you know, put on, but we need, I teach parents through my online courses to really focus on practicing, especially those number one words a lot, keeping them strong, and then working on the number two words, maybe with a speech pathologist to go like, you know, he really likes taco. We had this little boy and I had permission to share his name and everything. His name, his nickname was Chino. And he, he couldn't say Chino, but he could say no. And he could say Cheeto. So there, it doesn't take a speech pathologist to go like, oh, well, he can say this and he can say this. And part of the thing was chi, no, you know, say no, say chi, say Cheeto, say Chino. And we got him, we got it moved from number two to number one. So just to kind of, kind of go along what you're saying is parents really do have a lot of power to work on words and try to get words clearer. Yep. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, in um, in the new ESA manual, there's um, a uh, a form called a syllable tracker, and it's a tracking um, device um, for um, that would do exactly what you just said. You know, you can fill in the little boxes um, with the the consonants and the vowels, and kind of find where do they come together to um, to determine just to kind of track what can my child say? What can my learner say? And how can I put some of these together to make actual meaningful um, utterances for them that we let's, can reinforce? Let's talk about your new manual. Now, many of, at least the speech pathologists, BCBAs that uh, use the BB map assessment by Dr. Mark Sundberg. And last week we replayed Dr. Mark Sundberg's um, interview. Next week, we're going to be talking to Liz and Steve Marr about the BB Map app. But um, a lot of people, a lot of the professionals listening may know you from your work with, at, with the ESA, the ECHOIC assessment, which is part of the BB Map. And mm -hmm. that was originally published in 2008 mm -hmm. and then redone in 2014. Mm -hmm. And so it's ESA, it's a separate ECHOIC assessment. And can you tell us um, 
I mean, I described it a little bit, but why now do you have a new book coming out this spring? Um, well, you can get the title and stuff, but like, how's that different than the ESA or is it the same? Well, um, the name is the same, the Early Echoic Skills Assessment, but the, the new one is um, expanded and into more of a manual form, which has the test in it. Um, and then it has some instructional chapters to um, talk about syllable complexity or um, speech as a mechanical process and some of those sorts of things. Um, <clears throat> But the the impetus for improving it and sort of providing um, there's a, a, a work packet as part of the manual to um, do program plannings. Uh, the impetus for that came about from a lot of feedback that I got and questions over the years. And then um, Nakia Dower, um, who's the chair of the speech pathology a um, behavior analysis sig at abi ai um, uh, did a, a survey monkey for me a couple of years ago now and um we got a lot of feedback um for example well now that i've given this test what do i do with the results how how do i and most of those questions were from behavior analysts because um they were looking at it as an echoic assessment, thinking that, well, I guess I'm supposed to just teach echoics to this child that I'm trying to teach to speak. So I realized that there was a real need for to kind of put that in perspective that, um, yeah, at, the echoic skill uh, really um, for a young learner um is a sort of a, a crutch or or a support system for learning mans and tacts and interverbals and other language skills um so for example if you want to strengthen asking for something um you can say say cookie and and um and if you are working on echoic skills that will then strengthen it in a manned context so it has to stay that's the way language is learned so um we don't want people just practicing echoics like in drill format there may be a place for that with older learners like when i was in speech therapy learning to not lisp. I was 18 years old and I did a lot of drill and that was fine, but I had already acquired very strong language skills. So, um, but but new learners um, need not to, to drill for drill's sake on say this, say this, say this, say this um, as, um, as an echoic skill that doesn't have any connection to anything. So, um, so the information about, well, what do you do with this echoic um, assessment information, um, it, it became obvious that people needed a guide. They needed to know, well, how do I plan a, an, a beginning speech acquisition, speech language acquisition program with this information? And um, so there's program planning and the work packet. There's a lot of um, practice sheets on um, coding and figuring out what the sort of the profile of syllables is, how hard is it, how many different consonants, how many different vowels, how many syllables, and so on. There's also a, um, an appendix full of, I don't know, maybe a couple dozen um, forms, worksheets um, that um, people can access and print those and use them for, the, for their own programs, including the syllable tracker that I mentioned. <clears throat> and I, um, I did, I do want to tell listeners that I got to preview Barb's book and it's excellent. Um, and it really does take the ESA, which is just really 
a very, you know, a one part of the VB map assessment, but not a whole lot of direction and not a whole lot of in terms of what where to take it. So I'm I'm hoping that your new manual, which which should be out by May, and it'll be available on Amazon, and the title of it is early ECOIC skills assessment and manual for speech acquisition. Mm -hmm. um, so that's that's awesome. So do you see um, parents being able to read and put this in place or do you, do you see who who is who is really your target market for this book? Yeah, um, there is actually, I think, a sentence about who, who the who I hope will will benefit from this, and it's anybody that's charged with uh, the responsibility of trying to teach somebody to speak, and um, that includes certainly um, parents and classroom teachers and caregivers and and. Uh, people that don't have special training in speech pathology or in behavior analysis. Um, I tried throughout to be very redundant, saying things in different ways, in different places, giving uh, references um, that the information for this is back in chapter two, or um, here's another link, here's a video that you can look at to, um, to see um, what does it look like when I give the ESA to my child. You can watch the series of videos um, to oh, see nice. what to yeah. do that and so on. That part of it. That's, that'll be great. Yeah, that'll be really nice. And I know a lot of the parents and professionals in my online courses, you know, struggle with this in terms of teaching a COEX. I've done, I've done a, a COEX how to gain a co control or how, yeah, because people get stuck, you know? Um, and even just using like the early learner materials, it's in my book and courses and, and I've talked about here, but, you know, like you said, don't sit knee to knee and say, say, ba, say, you know, baba, say, you know, it's all the early learner materials that I do, like a shoebox with a slit into it you know, cup or banana or whatever. And you say it up to three times. And if the child says it, it's part man because they want to take it and put it in the box. It's part tact because they can see it. It's part echo because they hear you saying it. Um, they're following directions. They're sitting, they're happy, you know, and all of the materials that we use are what we call multiple control. So it's part manned, part tact, part echoic. And that's really where, I mean, you and I have been practicing this way for oh, decades, you know, because I've had my son and, and, you know, in the past, I mean, we did strict ABA traditional style and he was sitting knee to knee and we were doing that kind of thing. But ever since I've been a behavior analyst, we've been really using more child-friendly natural approaches to get mm -hmm. that echoic to be better and better. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and I think by that approach, you avoid some of the old style um, ways of trying to teach children that are having a tough time learning to talk, um, uh, it, it, where it becomes just a tug of war. You know, I don't want to go with you. I don't want to say what you're asking me to say because there's such a thin reinforcement schedule available to them. In other words, if they do it wrong or they don't say anything, then nothing, you know, their life doesn't improve in any way. They don't get the thing or or they don't get another push on the swing or whatever. Or they see the look on your face, you know, that, oh, you know, you you didn't do it right. So um one of the things I included in the new manual is a, a pretest of emergent echoic skills. And there's also in this pretest, there's some direction to if your child is not consistently vocalizing, then go to this other, here's some other resources. And so there's a little list of the kinds of things that you're talking about, peekaboo or making any anything, you know, where you're making fun sounds, they don't necessarily have to make sense, but they can just kind of 
get that foundation babbling stuff in place. It, it's also the case though, that with older learners that have not yet learned to speak um, very well at all. And, and I'm not, you know, my book and my interest, and my, my, most of my work has not been with children that could already talk, but just had articulation errors um, maybe 30 years ago, but not, not any time recently. It's more of a concern to me, what, what if you're not really speaking at all? Now, now what do I do as the, as the teacher, the parent, whatever? Um, um, those, those folks that are older that aren't talking, you know, a lot of uh, um, teachers are, are resistant to kind of thinking about, well, you know, having them babble nonsense kinds of things. And you don't have to do that. You can carefully arrange some things for them to say um, that are quasi babbling. <laughs> But the thing about babbling that's important is that it's usually very simple in terms of syllable complexity. Not a whole lot of different consonants, not a whole lot of different vowels in one unit of a syllable. Um, so those are the kinds of things to pay attention to if you have an older child or an older learner that isn't yet talking you don't they don't have to say goofy kind of <laughs> sounding things you can um, if if you pay attention to well what do I want to teach them to say and how complex are those syllables that I'm trying to put together for them if you keep that simple then you've achieved the same thing that a, a beginning learner um, is achieving at six months, nine months, 12 months old, because now you'll have the sequential steps in the right order. Mm -hmm. And and I love what you said earlier, you know, it's never too late for vocalization. Like I, I've seen people, Anna joined our online course when her son, Nick was eight years old and he had been through ABA school since he'd been three. He had doctoral level behavior analysts and speech pathologists working with, and they were really focusing a lot on a device, you know, having him use full carrier phrases, having him answer, my name is Nicholas, even though he was, she was fine with him saying Nick. You know, so when we started to, you know, and he was actually saying some things or trying to say some things like, ah, blah, 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 you know, as he was, as the uh, AAC was talking. And so we, you know, had to focus on, you know, Nick versus my name is Nicholas. And, and didn't he start talking just with mom working with him at home? So it's like never too late. I, I remember you know, a lot of parents and professionals, when I've done independent evaluations, which I haven't done for years, but, and I remember one of my last ones, it was a 17 year old. He had been in residential placement since he's been eight. And I interviewed the mom on the phone before I went in and everybody's calling him nonverbal. And I was like, so yeah, he's nonverbal, blah, blah, blah. And I'm like, does he say anything? Does he babble? Does he say uh, you know, like even, even saying, uh, to get your attention is better than nothing. Like, is he completely silent? And there's been, I can't even think of one child that's been completely mute and, and sure enough, oh, well, yeah, he can say mama occasionally, or he could say this or, you know, and then when I went into, to observe for the first and only time he was saying beads because, but he was saying be, you know, um, he was, he was humming music, like, like look for clues. Mm -hmm. Don't just say a child's nonverbal, like look for clues, look for syllables, look for vowels, look for word approximations mm -hmm. and don't give up. Yep. I, I completely agree. Vocal is you gotta, you, you really want to blend a vocal verbal and um, vocalizing, if you think about it as a mechanical skill, um, it actually Mark Sundberg um, in 
a book that he published with Jim Partington, um, I think in 98, um, teaching language to ch children with- The big book um, that came with the Ables, but everybody got right. it. And yeah, the, their chapter book. four is on alternative communication. And they really introduced the topic um, you know, very, very well from my perspective that, you know, why would you consider a non-speech system, either sign language or an AAC? Why would you do that? Well, there are times to do that, but if you have someone that's regularly vocalizing and even maybe has some echoic skill, then you wanna maximize that first um before you sort of let that go by the wayside and i think it's easier for people to maximize that vocalizing and see if they can sort of parlay that into um you know speech like like your your friend who was switching from something difficult like nicholas to something easier like nick um it if you think about syllable complexity, that's a much easier thing to say, Nick, than to say Nicholas. And um, whenever you make it easier, you also increase the likelihood that there will be reinforcers available <laughs> that that will strengthen. And so it kind of snowballs into a lot of success by taking that approach, I think. Yeah, definitely. Well, this has been super valuable. Um, how can people, I know we said that in May, your book will be available on Amazon. Um, how can people get in touch with you or follow your work? Mm -hmm. uh, I'm on LinkedIn and I'm happy to have people email me if they want. So you, you, you can certainly um, uh, post that. Um, or I could be uh, reached through the SPABA website or um, their Facebook page as well. Um, and although I'm not on Facebook, they, they will get those messages to me. Okay. Well, I really appreciate your time. Let's, let me ask you one more question before I go. Uh, part of my podcast goals are not to just help the kids, but also help parents and professionals be less stressed and lead happier lives. So do you have any self-care tips or stress reduction techniques that you use to be less stressed? There is something I've said to a lot of parents that seems to resonate with them. And that is um, to take the long view that your child is not getting any younger. Your child is going to be a grown up someday. And so you have a lot of, uh, a big long timeline as a trajectory for this person to learn things. And it doesn't all have to get done by tomorrow morning and it doesn't have to be done perfectly. Um, I think we all wanna be as perfect as we can <laughs> as much of the time as we can, but that's unrealistic. And so, you know, one needs to accept the fact that I'm doing the best I can with my available information and my available skills. And those will increase as I learn more and as I practice more. But in the meantime, I, I can take the long view um, that I don't have to do everything and I don't have to do it all by tomorrow morning or next week. And I think. Um, a lot of people have said to me, parents have said, Phew. you know, that that feels good uh, just to remind myself um, because it's a heavy burden. I don't have to tell you that. And to find anything that can de-stress, if you think about, well, what is stress? Um, it's a lot of um, expectations that we put on ourselves. And so if you can change those expectations somewhat um, to be more realistic, I think it's a kindness that you can, can do for yourself. I saw someone uh, at one time say, you know, just do this. <laughs> Give yourself a hug. 
Yeah, yeah. that's awesome. Yeah, I, ne- I never really thought about stress being expectations that you had that were unrealistic or or potentially unrealistic. I mean, there are a lot of other kinds of stress yeah, yeah, no, it's, it's landing good. on your roof or something. But don't look at it though. No, I appreciate <laughs> that. And yeah, I think taking a long view and and you know, this is your this is not just your child's life, it's your life too. Um, and so you need to, you know have goals and and do stuff other than autism uh 24 <laughs> 7 which uh, tends to be hard but thank you so much Barb I um I always enjoyed talking to you I've learned a ton from you and I think you know your work is has just been really instrumental in helping a lot of kids and their families and professionals too, and helping the field of speech pathology, as well as behavior analysis. Um, It's just been uh, really, you're, you're just a true pioneer. So thank you uh, from, from me and all my listeners out there. And uh, thanks for your time today. Yeah, thanks for the opportunity, Mary. It's been wonderful. And um, back at you with uh, with the books that you've written. <laughs> well, thank you. Thank you. So you can get all the information about everything we talked about at marybarbera.com forward slash 220. Um, I would really take a look at that three hour workshop that changed my life way back in like 2015 or 16. Um, you will glean some stuff, I'm sure. Um, So thanks again, Barb. Have a good one and I'll see you all next week. Thanks, Mary.